So without any further ado, I'm going to do a quick intro of our two guests. We've got uh, Minority Leader Paul Thiessen uh, to my right here. And uh, State Senator John Marty up to my left. each one of them just to, for a couple of minutes to kind of set the stage for the conversation we're going to have here. Um, and then I've got a few questions already from you. Remember, you can continue sending them. Uh, hashtag NMN11. And so with that, I guess we'll just get started. Uh, Minority Leader Tisa, will you go first? Thank you. There we go. Uh, thank you uh, for having me here today. Uh, and I'm really pleased to be up here with Senator Marty. Who I got to know a lot better over the last couple of years, but I think is is really one of the um, one of the finest uh, public servants that we have in our state, and really has stood up for the values I think that we all share. Uh, and I'm always pleased to spend time. You know, I think it's a uh, it's fitting in some sense today that we're gathered here on on uh, Martin Luther King's actual birthday, as opposed to the day we celebrated on, uh, because I think what I you know, and as I was getting ready for an event actually earlier today, I was reading through some of the things that he said, some of his quotes, and one of the things he said is that we're not called here to be searchers for consensus, but to be molders of consensus. And I think that one of the things that we have failed at as a progressive movement is the failure to understand that distinction as we've moved forward here. You know, it's not really about talking about, a lot of people like to talk about finding the middle ground. Uh, but really, it's about finding the common ground that's, con that's the place that's consistent with our values that we can share with other people. Uh, because when we try to find the middle ground, we continue, I think, as progressives to find the middle ground, and then the conservatives don't move, and then we find the next middle ground, and the conservatives don't move, and so on, and so on, and so on. And so I think the, the real important thing uh, that we should kind of work on together when we think about messaging, and messaging in itself is you know, kind of a hollow thing, that we want to have something underlying it. I think it's this idea that we need to be look, looking and, sh and shaping the landscape where we have a common ground where we can agree with on people, but that's consistent with our values. And that's what we're going to be trying to do uh, in our DFL House Caucus as we move forward. I think one of the reasons we lost the last election is we lost control of the conversation that people were having on the streets. And what we knew, need to do is re reclaim that conversation so we're talking and fighting on our grounds. Uh, and I don't think that the mainstream media is particularly our friend in that, uh, because even though they talk about bipartisanship uh, and they talk about wanting everybody to get along, the bottom line is what that does is it favors the status quo. You know, because what they're saying is don't fight so much, don't fight about what you believe, just kind of settle for what you can all agree on. And when you do that, you're just settling for the status quo, which favors those who currently have the power in our society. And if you look especially at what's going on with income inequality in this country and in this state, I think that underlies really fundamentally a lot of the other social and political problems that we're facing. And I really applaud Governor Dayton for standing up even in front of the Chamber of Commerce and saying exactly that thing, uh, because it needs to be said over, over and over again. So what I guess my message would be to you uh, is to help us in that effort which is to continue to fight for what we believe and not back down because people are saying, oh, please just, please just get along. Of course we should search for solutions that work for all Minnesotans, but we gotta, we gotta focus on that all Minnesotans side of the, side of the equation uh, and not just focus on the uh, get along and settle side of the equation. And so what I would ask you to do as we move forward uh, toward the 2012 election is that you work with us to continue to talk about the fact that what we've done over the last 10 years, an example, is balance our budget on the backs of the middle class while other parts of our society are getting off scot-free or getting a benefit. And that truly is the direction uh, that the Republican majorities want to go in Minnesota. I mean, they, if you look at the four priorities they listed as their legislative priorities, it mirrors exactly the priorities of the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, who essentially bought, you know, bought this election for them. So we have a lot of work to do, uh, and we're going to need everybody in this room to step up and uh, join us in that fight, and we will join you in that fight, talking about what really matters to Minnesotans and talking about the fact that we need to be doing the right things for all Minnesotans and not just a select few. So I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Good 
and I want to agree with a lot of what Paul is saying because I think he and his caucus, Senator Bach and our Senate DFL caucus, I think we want to see ourselves as majority party in exile for two years. We're going to be coming back and we want to have a DFL progressive legislature to work with Governor Dayton so we can move forward as a state. And in the next two years, I don't think it has to be one of surrender and we're not going to get there and we got to let them do their damage and so on. I think the way Mark Dayton has articulated has been done masterfully. And he's the one with the soapbox now. It's not a Tim Pawlenty anymore. That's the number one change in the election is we no longer have Tim Pawlenty. We got Mark Dayton speaking out and that makes a difference. And if you look at him on the tax stuff, I mean, he was very open throughout the whole campaign. And as Paul said, he didn't duck at the Chamber of Commerce. He joked with them and then he told them what they had to hear. What actually would be the best thing for business would be a tax system that funds the public services and the infrastructure, the human infrastructure, the education and everything else that makes us the kind of place where their businesses can thrive. So I think that's one of the things we've got, a message we've got to get out there is this is pro-business to have a tax climate that funds the services that businesses need. And I think that when he talks about taxes, people, well, I don't want to pay taxes, I don't want to pay taxes. His inaugural address was very articulate in terms of that. He said his budget's going to have that in, and he knows, frankly, the Republicans in the legislature are probably going to put out a budget without that. And he says, you know, if they can put out a budget with no new taxes, that doesn't hurt schools, that doesn't tear apart our infrastructure, that doesn't destroy the life that we want to have in Minnesota, he'll sign it in a day. Which gets to the point that it's not about taxes, it's about making sure we have a government that works for people. And I think that's a message that we have to help him with every step of the way. I think he should be proud of his tax policies when he's talking with the Chamber of Commerce. I think we ought to be too. Last week in Judiciary Committee, we had all the parts of the court system. We had the Supreme Court Chief Justice, very conservative. We had public defenders, we had prosecutors, we had police chiefs. All of them coming in there and saying, you know, if you cut the courts anymore, we're gonna destroy, we're destroying our society. They pointed out that an appeals court last month we freed a guy who had been convicted of a felony because he didn't get a timely trial. They said, this is a law enforcement issue now. And the Republicans are looking at, well, we're going to cut this and we're going to cut this. We're going to slash this to the bone. Well, they're not going to be building us a very good state. And I think Paul said it well about the fact that we have to be doing, we have to be getting out our message now. We have to be shaping the agenda now, not waiting two years. We've got a governor to work with us. We've got you to work with us, and I know our caucus is trying to work more closely with all the new media and all of you to make sure we can help get that message out. And I know the House DFL caucus has the exact same goal, and we look forward to working with you. And I look forward to the questions. Um, so just picking up on that, one of the questions was, um, how will you, um, let's talk tactics a little bit maybe, um, create this message and not wait till 2012? Well, okay, I gotta wait a little bit when I turn it on. Uh, a couple of things that I would say to that. Uh, the first thing is we are very, we, uh, Senator Terry Bonoff and I and our media folks actually held a conversation with some of the, the, the um, new media, the bloggers in, the, uh, in Minnesota, just this last Thursday to start kind of talking about how we can uh, orient our message together and use each other more effectively to get our message out. But I guess the biggest thing that I would say our strategy is as the minority, we want to spend as little time uh, in the building across the freeway in the state capitol as possible and spend as much of our time uh, outside the capitol, uh, meeting with people in the community, uh, meeting with people all across the state because I think that's the most effective way that we can get our message out. I mean, some people pay attention to the intricacies of what's going on at the capitol. Most people don't. And I think if we can get our members out and get all of you out into the community talking to people one-on-one -on -one and in small groups about the issues that matter to them, that's the way we're going to start to fundamentally change the conversation. So that's, that's a big uh, effort of ours. And then we really do want to focus on what are the real life impacts of this all cuts budget, as Senator uh, Marty was saying, that it's really going to affect not just poor people and not just marginalized people, but 
families all across this state, and we need to get that message out to people. Spending more time at the Capitol is not going to do it. We should be spelling out with our legislative proposals what we want to have happen, the direction we want to see the state move. But I think we're kidding ourselves if we think we're going to pass a lot of that. We know we're not going to. We put it out there to show people where we want to go, and then we got to be speaking out. And we got to shape the direction. I don't think we'd be afraid to hear their side of it. I think Mark Dayton, when he signed the bill for 95,000 more people to be signed up for early enrollment and medical assistance, people were there. A lot of our folks were there, but so were a lot of Tea Party folks. Our folks were there to see this, celebrate this signing of this important legislation. Their folks were there with signs to protest. And Mark presents his thing and signs the document and talks about it. And then he invites one of them to come up and use the microphone too. And a lot of people, are, I think his own staff was shocked by the fact that he did this. But I think it was a masterful move. He had them speak, then he had a couple of supporters of what he did speak, then he had a couple more of the opponents speak. And one of the opponents talks about government health care and how he hates government health care, and then, oh yeah, he's been on VA for 40 some years. And people were kind of looking and thinking, boy, these guys are really articulate. And it made his message even stronger because he's not ashamed to debate, to discuss it with the other side. But we have to, as Paul said, we have to be going out there. And one of our best tools is working with all of you. And I think that's why it's very important that our caucuses meet with you on a regular basis, get you the information you need so that you can help get the message out. So it sounds like it's speaking out, it's getting out of the Capitol. Are the, are the ways that you're going to do that? Get, getting out. And also, you know, we want letters to the editor and all that kind of, all those pieces, the old media and the new media. And so to the extent that we can kind of communicate with each other what's going on at the Capitol, communicate that with you so then you can disseminate that further, uh, you know, especially for some of the, the, um, the newer members of the opposing party who, who are still getting their feet under them. I think it's going to be important to point out to their communities decisions they're making that are not in the benefit of their communities, and we're going to want to make sure that we do that as well. Great. Um, so how can we continue to work on Minnesota Health Plan with the GOP control of the legislature? I think that's for you. Well, we, we're not going to pass certain bills this year. We reintroduced the Minnesota Health Plan. But right now, I think the first things we have to do is move as aggressively as we can to get the people signed up for medical assistance. I mean, I, I think I was really proud of Governor Dayton. The one time, the only time I've heard him criticize his predecessor, the only time I saw him get angry between the election and the swearing in was when he found out that the governor's his human services department said it would take him nine months to enroll all these people. He said, what are you waiting for? And what do you mean it's not acceptable? The bottom line is people die during those nine months. And he's got to do it right away, and he will do it right away. But I think right now we're going to first get more people enrolled. I'd like to make sure we do a better job of looking at how much we've got $3 billion in contracts with health plans right now. They have no audits, no competitive bids, no anything else. The Palenti administration thought that was just fine. I think we've got to be looking aggressively at that because that's a lot of money there. But for the big picture for truly universal health care, I think what we're going to see is um, federal reforms helped cover a lot more people. They do some good things, but it's not going to fix the problem. We have to keep pushing on that. Mark is willing to do that. We need a legislature back before we can really do much at the Capitol. Um, how will the DFL focus on building clean energy, building a clean energy economy, and m move the debate away from nuclear energy and coal? Uh, well, I think that the, the the key thing, I mean, and and just to set some background for those who aren't at the Capitol, there's initiatives at the Capitol right now to repeal the moratorium on nuclear and to roll back our moratorium on new coal as well. And so the, the push at the legislature is going in the other, other direction. I think that what we're focusing on, is, I think there's a consensus among Minnesotans that moving in a direction of reducing carbon emissions is the right way to go. I think most Minnesotans would agree with that. And so we're kind of on the, on the right track on that issue. And we need to explain, first of all, what we did and that it's not onerous. And, and if you talk to the utilities, they can be our friends on this because they testified in committee just this last week that, um, that they're ready, they're reliable, they've set up a system of reliable renewable energy and they don't have concerns about it. If they don't have concerns about that issue, I don't know why other people would either. They're the experts. But the other thing that we have to focus on is the fact 
that in the end, in the short term really, and in the long term, renewable energy is a much more cost effective way to go. And I think we need to make that cost argument over and over and over again. And that's the, especially with nuclear. Uh, you know, if you look at what's happening across the country, well, not across the country, but in a couple of places where they're building nuclear plants, they're running over budget and they're running over time. And those costs are being borne by ratepayers and taxpayers, not utility shareholders. And we need to make sure that we educate people and explain to people this is a really expensive op uh, option. I don't know if any of you watched Almanac last night, uh, but I thought Representative Knuth did a really great job uh, articulating this. And if you haven't had a chance, go and, go and check out Almanac last night because Kate Knuth, uh, I think, laid out the case for that really well. One more thing I want to add on that is the Public Utilities Commission, the governor now, he appoints those commissioners. We should press him and encourage him to pick people who are strong environmental consumer advocates to be there because for the last 25 years we've had nothing of that sort. Governor Carlson at one point, I think he appointed his chiropractor, the Public Utilities Commission. Um, we've got to have people who are not supporting the utilities, but who are looking at the public interest. Because if we do all the external costs, I mean the coal power, I mean it's just off the charts in terms of when you count the environmental and health impacts of it. If we have a public utilities commission that look at that, they're not going to be doing more coal. We can't control the legislative stuff, but we can control it through the Public Utilities Commission. And as Paul mentioned, yeah, the, the bills, one of the first bills they introduced, the first dozen bills they introduced is repeal the nuclear moratorium. You know, I kind of wonder how many decades do they think it's be before those things would ever come online in the first place? And if we look back 30 years when I think it was the Tyrone plant that they were proposing to build in Wisconsin, I think they put a billion dollars into that before it fell through. And our ratepayers got stuck with that, partly because our Public Utilities Commission allowed that. I think what we have to do now is have a good Public Utilities Commission, plus, again, the Kate Knuths, the Ellen Andersons, our best ally, our strongest supporters in the legislature have to be outspoken in this so we can get our message out instead of their cheap coal. It's not cheap. I was saying, I know we could talk about this one for a long time, but the question is what constitutional amendments do you think will come up and how can we fight them? I'll go first. I, I think there have already been about three or four introduced. I think they're going to have dozens of constitutional amendments proposed. I don't know how many of them they're actually going to move forward with. I mean, the one message I'd, I'd give to the Republicans, directly to them, not to the public at large, but take the marriage equality one. If they want to try and block that, I don't think they really want that on the ballot. They may think they do. In 2003, they wanted it on the ballot because it would have gotten busloads of their people out to the polls. 2012, it'll get busloads of our folks out to the polls, more than theirs, and I think that would really help us in the election. But we don't want that because we don't want to spend two years talking about hate anymore. And that's why we've got to block that one. But the reason you're going to see all this is because they don't have to go through the governor for that. They can just a simple majority in the House and Senate and it goes on the ballot. And I think we're going to see all kinds of things on abortion. We're going to see things, I mean, who knows, they're probably going to try the, um, the ballot, the election things, the voter ID stuff. And I think we're going to have to use every tool we can to get the message out now um, and, and recognize help them recognize that putting a lot of these things on the ballot might look like they're playing games with things when they said their number one agenda item was the budget. And so I think we, um, we don't give them all the rope to hang themselves if we can stop it, but if they choose to do it anyway, I think we have to go out there. We can win those amendments. And if they put a bunch of those on the ballot, I think we're gonna win those amendments. But we don't wanna have that kind of fight the next two years. So I think everything we can do at the Capitol, anything you can do to get the message out, on those, let's stop them from even voting on them at the Capitol. Well, just a couple quick, uh, couple quick points. I mean, I think ex the, the main thing we have to do and what we're trying to do, and, and if we can have your help in doing it, is, is this point that they have said, uh, getting the budget done and getting the economy going is their number one priority. We just need to hold them accountable to that and focus on that, because that should be what all of us are concerned about and not these other things. And I do want to touch on one other issue that uh, is, is going to, has, has already been introduced as a constitutional amendment, and that's attacking our labor laws in this state. 
uh, moving toward a right to work kind of state. Well, I shouldn't even use those words in terms of messaging, right? But moving against kind of the progressive tradition that we have had on labor in this state for a long time. And I think really the, the, the biggest danger on this issue is the fact that we have been good on labor for so long that we've come to uh, accept it as part of the landscape instead of understanding why it was put there and why people fought really hard to get those protections there in the first place. And so I think one of the things we have to do is re-educate Minnesotans about why we put these protections for workers in in the first place uh, so that people understand how important and what the stakes really are here. Uh, and so I would encourage you to, to work with us to make sure that we can get that message out. Uh, I just have to say it's kind of ironic that these constitutional protectors keep on wanting to open up the Constitution. That's why you're a Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so one of the questions we wanted to ask everybody here is, because um, we're going to close this out and pretty soon uh, U.S. Senator Al Franken will be joining us, um, but what role will social media play in the next year, uh, 2011 and 2012. Um, I feel like we've entered a world where legislators tweet from the floor and, uh, you know, and, and all of that, I know that chatter affects the work that you guys do for good and for worse. So I'd like to kind of hear some of your thoughts about how it's changed the work you've been doing up at the Capitol in the last two or three legislative sessions. And then also how you think it might affect the 2012 elections. Um, you know, is it just another lawn sign, or is there something more to social media than, than that? Well, I would, uh, I'll give two examples and then kind of a, an, another answer. You know, the, from a legislative process thing, I think the, the impact of new media really became, uh, social media really became obvious to me in the 09 session. At the end of that session, and typically when we're sitting over there, unless you're in the leadership kind of negotiations, you don't know really what's going on. But in 09, all of a sudden, with Twitter, we started to get these reports out of those discussions that circulated much, much faster. And I do think it changed the dynamic of those negotiations because more people had more information. And I think uh, kind of it moved us in, in a good direction. So that's, that's kind of inside the legislature. The other example I'll give is, is with uh, Representative Erickson's comment, uh, Sandra Erickson's comment just this last week where she equated the teachers union's proposal with being the Gestapo. And I don't know if any of you saw that. But uh, it was not really picked up by the mainstream media until the social media started to, to retweet it and retweet it and get it out there on Facebook. And then it was picked up in a real way and she apologized faster than I've ever seen anybody apologize in the legislature for something. So like a direct impact on the way that, uh, the, way that the legislature operates. Uh, from a larger perspective, I guess the thing that I would say about um, about the, the social media comes back to one of the things I started out with is I, I do think that the mainstream media in general, not so much reporters, but the commentators and the pundits that are out there really are, even if they're liberal in a sense, favor the status quo and so favor the conservative agenda because we have to fight for change to, to, because that's the direction we want to move in a progressive way. And I think the role that the, that the social media can play is to challenge the new media to cover stories that they wouldn't otherwise cover, to call them on things that, wouldn't, that aren't otherwise, that they wouldn't otherwise be called on, and just to kind of be the voice for those people who don't typically have a voice in that media discussion. And I think that's going to be in more and more powerful. And, and, and I guess the last thing I'll say, if, as we look at Citizens United and the impact that that may continue to have on our politics, that piece of it of raising up people's voices who don't have a lot of power and a lot of money and a lot of voice is going to be more and more important. With Paul, because that's exactly right. The major media, you know, they miss so many stories. And the ability, what direction is social media going to play, new media? I think a lot of that is your creativity, your willingness to work hard on it, your chance to make it happen. As he mentioned, when, when we hear a Sandra Erickson type of quote like that, when anybody hears it, you got to make that spread like wildfire. The thing, the only caution I'll say is make sure you don't get something that's misinformed and then repeat that because that's not going to help us. It's going to have one mistaken statement pulls you back so much and people distrusting it. But I think that's where we have to go. Take everything you hear, everything that you know is accurate, and spread it and dig into these things. 
I think so many investigative reporters aren't at the newspapers or TV stations anymore. They're new media people. Republicans got some really vicious people doing this, but we got more of them and we got more creative people. And so every time you hear something you think ought to be shared, any time you hear something Paul Thiessen says or Mark Dayton says or anybody says that you think makes sense, quote it. When you hear something outrageous from the other side, quote it. Put it in your own context. You know, we read those blogs, we learn from them. We all are learning from each other. That's why it's such a good democratic system where what you say is picked up by others who feed it in other ways. And we all get ideas from each other. So I don't know which way it's going to go, but I can't agree more with him about the importance of it and the fact that the more you get out there quickly with things, the more it spreads. And when there's a story that one newspaper writes about and you think it's powerful and you don't see it being heard, find ways to spread it to others because often the media misses things and the new media, social media, can get around that and can be our best friend and our best ally in that. So I uh, can't say enough about the importance of that and how it's going to happen. That's up to your creativity and ours working together. So thanks a lot for all you've been doing on that to make it happen.